Hello, everyone. My name is Jamelia Morgan. I'm a professor of law at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and faculty director of the Center for Racial and Disability Justice. I am Jordan Jensen. I am the executive director of the Center for Racial and Disability Justice. So we're delighted to be here today to talk about how critical disability theory can help us all understand what we're terming the criminalization of disability. Um, in many ways, what we see when we see people who are experiencing mental distress responded to with law enforcement, uh, responded to with force, we're seeing what can be termed the criminalization of disability. We wanna talk a little bit about this and first, in so doing, we want to explain what we mean by critical disability theory, center a few models for understanding and thinking about disability critically in society, and then apply these insights to understand the criminalization of disability. So first, what is critical disability theory? So to really understand a critical disability theory, we have to first understand disability studies. A disability studies is a multidisciplinary field of study that seeks to understand and expose the continued history of oppression and marginalization of people who experience disability. In many ways, disability studies is a relatively new discipline starting in the 1990s and um, appearing in a number of academic departments across the country. Now, critical disability theory builds on and expands some of the core insights of disability studies, which we will um, address in particular. So how do we think about critical disability theory? So many adherents to CDT um, follow um, the certain viewpoints expressed in Pothier and Devlin's our, um, um, iconic book, Critical Disability Theory. Uh, one of the key insights that we can think of is that disability is not fundamentally a question of medicine or health, nor is it just an issue of sensitivity or compassion. Rather, it is a question of politics and powerlessness power over and power to. So what does this mean? We'll talk about in a few minutes the medical model of disability and how that predominates the ways of thinking about disability in society. But one key insight that we should take from critical disability theory is that disability is more than just a diagnosis. Disability indicates differences and deviations from the norm that have social significance, that impact one's ability to access resources, safety, um, opportunities to thrive and exist in the world. It's more than just a diagnosis. And because it implicates questions of power, we are hyper-concerned with the ways that bodies and minds are regulated in society. Um, to understand subordination, uh, marginalization on the basis of disability. Another key insight of critical disability theory is that it challenges some of the core ideas of American liberalism. Instead of really focusing in on the individual approaches to equality and inclusion, critical disability theory tries to contest the assumptions underlying inclusion and underlying um, equality. It is, again, attuned to some of the structural dynamics that might influence who is able to even qualify for things like jobs and housing, right? So thinking beyond just access and inclusion, but the underlying um, social conditions and relationships that might structure who has access in the first place, who is deemed qualified, eligible, and for our purposes, who is policed. A third key challenge is that it structures 
um, it, or rather it challenges the structure for societal organization that privileges people who conform to the dominant norm regarding bodies and minds. Sometimes we refer to this as abled body norms. Critical disability theory challenges the structure for societal organization based on these norms. It challenges the, the common beliefs that being normal and average are inevitable and that importantly, deviating from that norm um, in many ways um, uh, will lead uh, to criminalization, marginalization, um, an inability to uh, participate uh, in, the, uh, in the economy. And so a key challenge here is the challenge to um, the idea that productivity is essential to one's personhood. So when we think about these key challenges, the goal of critical disability theory is to um, push back against some of the assumptions that have contributed uh, to the marginalization of people with disabilities in society and that have inhibited people with disabilities as a group from more fully participating in contemporary society. Now, both disability studies and critical disability theorists um, provide methods for thinking about disability in society, how to understand it, how to think about disability-based oppression, but they also think about disability alongside other categories of subordination, namely race, gender, sexual orientation, class, and um, immigration status. Both of these disciplines define disability as a social construction while rejecting medical and biological models of disability. Engaging in the method of disability studies and critical disability theory, therefore, involves scrutinizing um, bodily and mentally, um, I'm sorry, mental impairments, uh, not only those impairments, but the social norms that define the particular attributes as impairments in the first place, as well as the social conditions that concentrate stigmatized attributes in particular populations. So we're really in many ways challenging the notion of what constitutes a, a um, physical or mental impairment and the meanings that attach to those quote unquote impairments. Both disability studies and critical disability theory emphasize that people with disabilities are not defective, are not deficient, are not victims, but rather are limited by social and environmental barriers. Um, as legal scholars Duran Dorfman and Rabia Belt explain, um, in many ways, disability studies and critical disability theory is grounded in the social model of disability, which contrasts biological diagnosis-based understandings of disability um, with the social meanings that attach to them. So let's talk a little bit about the medical and social model of disability. This is important because in many ways, the medical and social models of disability um, are contrasted in critical disability theory. So the medical model of disability um, focuses on diagnosis, cure, medical interventions, and the disability itself. Um, it sees disability as a health problem requiring treatment or cure. Um, the medical model of disability says that people are disabled by their diagnoses, by their impairments, and by their differences. It views disability as something that exists within the person. It encourages discussion of cure or medical intervention, and it frames disability as sickness and impairment, limit, limitation, or something wrong with the person. Um, the medical model is typically critiqued within critical disability theory 
by self-advocates, so people with disabilities and the disability community as a whole. Um, so why is the medical model a problem? Um, the medical model in this view in itself can pathologize um, disability and rests problem um, with access and inclusion solely within the body and mind of the person with a disability. So again, it frames disability as sickness, as quote unquote impairment, right? As a limitation, something wrong with the person. Um, so we're not saying in this case that we're against treatment, right? We're saying that if the focus is just on treatment or just on medical intervention, that we miss the ways that societal barriers can create discrimination as well. So in contrast to the medical model, um, the social model of disability um, brings attention to the ways disability is socially constructed. Um, the social model sees disability um, in part being produced by the social environment. The focus is um, on advocacy and on removing barriers, um, conferring rights, pushing back against ableism. The social model believes that people with disabilities are disabled by society, and it shifts that blame of disability as an individual fault, as something wrong with somebody, to a systemic failure of society. Within critical disability theory, the social model is considered the quote unquote big idea because it has led to progress around rights for disabled people. Um, again, it sees disability as a social construct, um, so not a biological fact. Um, it sees the world as contributing to producing um, what we call disabilities by failing to accommodate disabilities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jordan. So I think what we've done is laid out a framework for what can inform our analysis um, as to this problem that we have lifted at the beginning of the presentation relating to the criminalization of disability. Now, a couple notes about that term. I'm sure many of us have heard the phrase, the criminalization of mental illness. We are expanding that frame in two ways. So first, we're expanding it to include individuals who don't have um, only mental disability diagnoses. We are expanding it to include all individuals with disabilities. Why? Because criminal laws target individuals who have physical disabilities, target individuals who have uh, cognitive or intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as uh, mental disabilities, or what is termed mental illness. We're also not using the term mental illness consistent with disability rights movements to destigmatize um, mental uh, disability. So we will use the term mental disability or psychiatric disability consistent with those uh, particular values. So when I say that all people with disabilities are vulnerable to um, criminalization. Um, there are a couple areas that I want to focus on and highlight in my discussion to demonstrate why we are making that particular argument. So mass criminalization, the current era that we find ourselves in, where there are a pro proliferation of criminal laws that target all manner of social behaviors that produce social and physical disorders, uh, low level to high level crimes or harms more specifically, and of course, forms of violence. Um, we are in a society that responds uh, to all manner of social problems using criminal law. This has produced conditions where people with disabilities are vulnerable to punishment for conduct that is inextricably linked to their disabilities. Now, I want to be clear, this is not the intent in many cases of the laws, but 
in its enforcement, that is the uh, collective impact. A wide array of laws, criminal laws, and even municipal ordinances that might have civil penalty, penalties, um, but can accrue into um, you know, criminal sanctions if let's say there's a failure to pay a particular fine on a ticket. These laws make it so that police officers can ticket, detain, arrest, and jail people with disabilities. Now, there are a few things I wanna lift to show um, quickly how this can happen. So the first, I think, important thing to lift is the pathway to police violence, to use a term that Professor Devin Carbato uses in describing police violence. Now, most, most relevant to our conversation here is police involvement in mental health crisis response. Now, many of us are aware that we have um, um, not invested in our behavioral health systems to the extent we need to in order to meet the needs of all people experiencing mental distress or having mental health needs, which is a large group of people because mental health includes chronic care supports that all of us should use to maintain our mental health, as well as crisis services. The failure to adequately invest in a behavioral health system has meant that in many jurisdictions, police remain the dominant responders to mental health crisis response. We know that when police get involved, the risk of violence in responding to somebody experiencing a mental health crisis increases. Um, data, of course, um, that we might be familiar with suggests that over half of the people killed in encounters with law enforcement have a mental uh, di uh, mental disability diagnosis. So that creates a pathway to police violence. And one of the things that I've been able to surface in my research is that even when somebody is experiencing um, a mental health uh, or behavioral health uh, crisis, there's still a host of criminal laws that can punish them uh, through criminal sanction for those behaviors. So here in the city of Chicago in the fall, the city council passed a particular uh, or city ordinance to supplement the state assault law. Uh, this particular law targeted individuals who assaulted EMT workers. Now, by no stretch of the imagination am I arguing that our EMT workers should not be protected. Indeed, they should. We need to take care of all of our frontline staff. But we should also recognize and grapple with the use of criminal laws to respond to individuals very likely engaging in these assaults um, who are um, experiencing crisis. Uh, it's an intervention and it's a point of um, sort of opportunity to think through that use of criminal law uh, as opposed to more preventative therapeutic supports to prevent the assault from occurring in the first place. So in many ways, experiencing mental distress can create a pathway into police violence. One last area to think about in terms of our pathways to police violence, the fact that people with um, disabilities um, also exist among our unsheltered communities renders them increasingly vulnerable to criminal law enforcement, uh, protective um, sweeps, um, sweeps of homeless encampments, um, can disrupt a person's access to prescription drugs, can separate them from important um, property items, and can again result in criminalization. And so in that particular case, it's not so much that the uh, disability itself is linked to the um, conduct that is criminalized, but it's the fact that people with disabilities exist among the unsheltered communities um, that renders them vulnerable to this kind of criminalization. And in many ways, they exist in these public spaces and are unsheltered, in some cases due to medical debt, which do stem to disabilities, in other cases due to poverty. People with disabilities experience disproportionately high rates of poverty um, on account of 
the inability to access affordable and accessible health care to maintain um, employment, what have you. So we should think about the pathways to police violence, not from the typical individual culpability model of criminal law, but again, incorporating in a critical disability theory approach to understand why these vulnerabilities exist for people with disabilities with respect to police violence. The second area is what I refer to and many within policing scholarship refer to as aesthetics policing and how that particular kind of policing impacts people with disabilities. So in many jurisdictions, again, as I noted earlier, uh, criminal laws are used to regulate access to public spaces, maintain social norms in public spaces, i.e. how people are uh, to behave, how people are to appear. Generally, these laws we think of regulate social and physical disorder, whether it's a noise complaint, public intoxication, uh, public urination, and the like. So local jurisdictions under criminal, um, the various criminal laws, whether at the state or local lever, uh, level, uh, can enforce societal norms, regulate disorder, and manage access to public space. Well, you might say, so what? Uh, criminal law is just one tool for keeping our parks clear, our streets clean, tidy, and disorderly. Well, a couple responses. One, cities are by their nature disorderly. And to what extent uh, does the community get to decide what level of noise to tolerate, what level of disorder is appropriate for any major city? But I think more to the point of this discussion, in many cases, this aesthetics policing targets people with disabilities and results in the criminalization of disability. Now, in prior work, I've examined what are termed disorderly conduct laws. And one of the um, problematic aspects of the enforcement of these laws is that they can target people who are experiencing mental crisis in public spaces. It can label them as disorderly based on how they are appearing publicly, again, in need of mental health supports in some cases, um, or uh, simply expressing the full range of human emotions that many of us express perhaps in our private spaces. So in this particular context, the aesthetics policing, ensuring that disorderly people do not appear disruptive in public spaces, targets people with disabilities. And again, we should reference unsheltered communities because aesthetics policing has resulted in the um, sort of a um, broad-based removal of and sheltered communities from public spaces, disrupting access to medications, resulting in injuries, and in many cases, targeting people who are unsheltered on account of uh, their disabilities. So um, the third category that I wanna talk about is more specific to maybe what we know of as mainstream criminal laws, quality of life offenses, I've referred to, um, or I've included, but I've prior, previously referred to in my discussion of aesthetics policing. Um, other laws that uh, criminalize even when an individual might lack the individual culpability that we usually think of uh, accompanying criminal law, meaning that they um, you know, violated these laws because um, they had nowhere else to go. They didn't necessarily have the intent of violating these laws. Um, we can think about quality of life offenses as falling in that particular category, as I stated before, the aesthetics policing of people with uh, disabilities, um, in particular, uh, on account of maybe the enforcement of disorderly conduct laws, um, or the um, vagrancy laws that were uh, deemed unconstitutional almost 60 years ago that are still being enforced. Um, we can see that people with disabilities are swept up into the enforcement regime through quality of life policing. But in addition to what I've lifted, we see, again, misdemeanor and aggregate, aggravated assault um, on account of people experiencing mental crisis, um, assaulting, in some cases, 
um, where there is no physical harm, but of course, um, an assault need not always include a physical contact under, under state uh, laws, um, but people with disabilities, people with mental disabilities being swept up under these particular enforcement regimes. Um, we also see um, people with disabilities um, uh, being targeted for trespass. Now this could include a number of individuals who might have intellectual and developmental disabilities who wander onto private property, right? So enforcing a trespass law can criminalize disability. The person with IDD might not know that they are on private property, might've gotten lost, um, what have you. Um, another kind of law, resisting arrest, uh, disobeying an order, those kinds of laws can again, uh, target people with disabilities who might not comply with the requirements um, uh, being ordered of them by police officers. Now, it's important to note that police officers and police departments are um, um, under the, the provision of the ADA that applies to public entities. And so um, when they interact with people with disabilities, they have to um, provide reasonable accommodations. And so when communicating with a person with disability, that person's failure to understand, you know, doesn't end the matter uh, as a legal matter, right? It uh, might mean that the officer, um, you know, failed to provide a reasonable accommodation to ensure effective communication, which is why these sort of resisting arrest or uh, failure to um, obey an order uh, laws can criminalize disability because they might not take into account the communication needs and the accommodation needs of uh, people with disabilities before leveling these criminal sanctions. And then the last area of policing is this policing in and around hospitals. I was most surprised by this, I must say, as a researcher. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic has done a number of reports, um, actually through ProPublica, um, talking a bit about how um, um, the uh, Cleveland Clinic, the area around the Cleveland Clinic, one of the largest, most prestigious hospitals in the country, um, has targeted people with disabilities. Some uh, people who have been attempting to access or just um, um, accessed uh, healthcare. Um, so again, we see this sort of dis this policing of, of people in and around hospitals. Usually we see the kind of uh, quality of life uh, style enforcement around hospitals. And you might say, well, why? Well, it's to keep the hospitals quiet and orderly. And so individuals, uh, many of whom might have disabilities and might have indeed been seeking treatments for um, medical and disability related conditions have been targeted by these enforcements, uh, particular enforcement policies. Another thing to note is um, that the Cleveland uh, Clinic uh, reporting revealed, reporting by ProPublica revealed that people of color in particular were disproportionately targeted. And again, people of color also are people with disabilities. So should, we should note the racial and disability disparities in that quality of policing. So that kind of, I think, provides us with our last stop on understanding how we can think about um, critical disability theory with rela uh, as relates to policing. I wanna make one last note about um, people who are incarcerated with disabilities. So this term is often referred to as disability incarcerated. We know that um, in our state prisons, approximately one in three people report having a disability, whether physical, cognitive, or um, mental. Um, we also know that that number can increase to one in four people. Uh, if we include individuals with substance use dependencies, that number rises. I just wanna focus on a couple things. In both prisons and jails, reporting lawsuits and media accounts in general have documented that people with disabilities are routinely punished while incarcerated for, again, related behaviors, uh, behaviors that relate to their disabilities. Uh, they might be punished um, with confinement in disab um, disciplinary segregation, a form of solitary confinement for behaviors that are inextricably linked to their disabilities. Now, solitary confinement is a form of torture uh, according to the United Nations, and it is 22 hours a day or more in a cell that's roughly the size of an at-home bathroom very small um, bathroom, and 
While in solitary confinement, the individual will be denied access to visitation, reading materials, um, in some cases exercise, and importantly, will be denied access um, to confidential therapeutic visits and supports. Um, and this is exacerbated by prison systems who have failed to invest in robust mental health supports. So when individuals don't receive reasonable accommodations on the front end to allow them to abide by the prison uh, rules, the harsh prison rules and the difficult conditions, they may be punished with longer prison terms for failing to demonstrate rehabilitation. Um, uh, they might be denied access to participation in prison programs, prison programs that might be accessible to inaccessible to them. So let's say there's a anger management program that's on the second floor of the prison facility and there's not an accommodation for people with physical disabilities to access it, they might be denied access to those programs. And all this might impede their ability to leave earlier on good time credit, credits that accrue to individuals that demonstrate quote unquote rehabilitation while incarcerated on the prison end. So I think we should think about um, how again, disability is punished and seen as deviant when an individual can't comply with the harsh uh, prison rules often um, and can't adapt to these conditions. Again, we're seeing um, a punishing of any sort of deviance from the norm, right? It's labeled as a difference and a deviance and punished accordingly, as opposed to um, accommodating uh, that particular person. And to kind of take us back to that social and medical model, it's as though the diagnosis is what's controlling in particular the person's reactions, quote unquote, failures to abide by the prison rules rather than the prison or jail's inability, right? The, the environment, um, the inability to accommodate that person in the environment and to support them. So um, that concludes our discussion of how critical disability theory can be applied to thinking about policing and punishment systems. And in our uh, focus, um, in our remarks, our focus has been on uh, the criminalization of disability in general. And so um, I look forward to um, hearing from you. Um, Jordan and I can be reached through the following uh, ways, and we hope that you will um, keep up with the work that we're doing at the Center for Racial and Disability Justice. Thank you.